Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. We have uh, uh, motherboard version 2.0 that we'll be digging yep. into. Um, we want to take a second and just kind of talk about the last 60 days of videos, that, well, not 60 days, but last 60 calendar days of videos that we've shot for you guys. And it's been a lot of information we've thrown out um, over the course of, I don't know, eight, 10 videos or something like that. A variety of lengthened videos and uh, how in depth we go and how- Some you know, techie, some not so techie, yeah. yeah. It's cool to have a, a good you know, mixture, we feel. Um, what are some like the highlight big things that we've talked about in the last 60 days? So part of it has been trying to bring you guys along on the engineering uh, journey with us, you know, and it's, um, you know, when some companies launch products, it just magically appears and they say, hey, it, it's great, yeah, it's great, trust us, buy it. Um, we wanted to show you kind of the process that goes along with it. And that's why we've been updating you um, as we hit major milestones and kind of trying to explain what goes into it. Just personally, I just like it selfishly. I, I, I think it's it's cool to see product development and we've gotten pretty good response from you guys as well. And for me, it's an appreciation thing. Right, like I. If you don't know. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, it's just another radar detector. Or exactly. I, I, as the you know typical consumer, just don't know unless yep. you tell me. So, um, hopefully, you guys are enjoying the videos. If you are, make sure you hit subscribe um, and like the video. Um, support your local yep. you know uh, radar enthusiast company. <laughs> um, so yeah, that being said, let's talk about version 2.0 of our motherboard. Yeah. Uh, what's changed from? Let's actually talk about like the generic version exactly. and then version the one and then version two. Yeah. So we've done, uh, I think, one, one other previous video on the motherboard before, and then we showed, even before that, a generic motherboard, uh, which was designed specifically for our processor, but had nothing to do with a radar detector. It was just like a computer motherboard that you can plug in a keyboard and a monitor to. So we went from that to our first version of the Thea motherboard, which, uh, again, we'll link the video here so you guys can see it if you haven't. But it was basically a red version of this. Um, and then we went from that to version 2.0, which is essentially our production version. Um, what changed from version 1 to 2? Because uh, the generic version was pretty, you know, there's a lot of modifications and changes from yeah, generic. Yeah, because it had nothing to do with a radar detector, right. yeah. Uh, so from going from version 1 to version 2, what changed? So the goal of the version 1 motherboard was simply to have something that worked at a bare minimum viable level. Yeah. Um, because that was completely designed uh, from scratch, designed in-house, stuff is going to go wrong. I mean, it's a complicated process. There's hundreds or thousands of traces and net lists and pinouts that need to be done right, and stuff always goes wrong. Not a, not a ton of errors, though, like surprisingly yeah, Actually, not. yeah, we, we did extremely well with that, and I'll touch on that in a second. Um, but version two was then about looking back at version one, kind of what we had accomplished, and saying, OK, where did we where did we either make an error or where did we miss an opportunity to make the product better? Um, some of the things that we've added in version two are actually kind of like feature ads or quality of life stuff um, that make a better radar detector uh, that we just forgot to, to put into version one. A good example of that is we added an ambient light sensor. Um, now the reason that we did that is uh, in addition to just it's always better to have another sensor, I think it'd be cool to have features like automatic brightness based on real ambient light instead of like a time. Yeah. Um, I know any detector that has a real ambient light sensor, I tend to like how those work better. So that was something that I just omitted in version one. It was kind of like lower down the priority list. We didn't have time. We, were, nice rushing to have. To, we were rushing to a prototype. Mm -hmm. But because we did so well on the uh, version one, we had some extra engineering time where we could start doing those nice to have things. Yeah, so think about like, um, you know, selfishly thinking about motorcycle riding, thinking about like how much sun there would be versus inside a cabin of a limo, right? I know it sounds dumb, but like yeah. there's a definite difference between there. Also, if you're going through a three mile long tunnel, <coughs> um, that it's not too bright or too dim. Um, I think it's brilliant and it's, yeah. I think, a cool f you know, feature to have. When it's, it's tricky too. I mean, when I say we have some extra engineering time, it, on the surface it sounds like such an easy thing to do. Just say, oh, add an ambient light sensor. Uh, those of you who are, are familiar <laughs> with like a, what a photodiode is, for example, will we'll understand it's just one little part. But you have to have the circuit for the part two and then even beyond that, you have to decide like where to put it. Um, I know some detectors have them on the top of the case and um, Cooney was actually the one that, that was what I just originally was going to do. I said, well, mm -hmm. everybody else puts it there, let's put it on top of the case. And Cooney made a very good point saying, that's probably not the best location. If you mount it high and tight on the, um, the headliner, or like with a visor clip, oh. it might appear darker than it actually is. <coughs> so we had to iterate with a couple different placements, and we ended up putting it 
on the side right here and working with mechanical to make sure that light could actually get to it because otherwise it's not going to work. So there's a lot of little little things that even go into something the small like that. The magical fairy just doesn't place it. In yeah, the right. I wish. Yeah, it would be so much nicer. So you're talking about um, the setup over here with the uh, USB-C and the microphone head or microphone headphone jack. What about this riser that was not there last yes, time? Yes, good eye. So those of you who remember our original motherboard will know that this kind of riser card or another daughter board that the USB port, the ambient light sensor, and the microphone slash headphone jack sit on wasn't there before. Um, now that this prototype was designed to kind of be the pr final production version, we had to pay more attention to mechanical design and things that go into like little nitpicky things that for a prototype version one didn't matter, but now we have to get it right. Otherwise, we have to do a V3 and a V4. I would say obsessive, <coughs> yeah. obsessive amount of detail. Yeah. So um, our industrial designer on the case was really adamant where the placement of these should be. And they didn't want them like too low on the case or too high. It has to be right in the middle. And it's a metal enclosure, which means you don't have much latitude to work with. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be lined up and, yeah. and machined and tooled properly. So this riser uh, card was literally just to elevate um, the ports properly to get them to match the industrial designer's view of, of where they should be mechanically. Um, so. Yeah, a lot of little things like that. And then uh, the breakout board, that's also a little bit yep. tweaked, right? That's that's yeah. Well, so that's new. That that didn't exist before. Um, one thing that I've explained before, um, not with this specific specific breakout board, um, but with like the AI and stuff like that, is that we've developed ways that we can keep developing the the software of the product before the final hardware is done, and then just drag and drop the final production software onto the hardware. It saves us time. Uh, this breakout board here is pretty cool. So our digitizer, which is where the ADC, or analog to digital converter, and the FPGA live, in other words, the circuit board that does a lot of processing stuff, that's not finished yet. We're going to probably do a video on that in a couple of weeks. Um, but it's funny, because we do have on the computer all of our DSP software already being written and developed, and then obviously, we have the AI and Thea here. So what's missing is that link in between. We have no way to connect our software to Thea so we can keep developing in the meantime. So this is called a breakout board. And this is what uh, one of our engineers designed and, and fabbed up in-house. And what that allows us to do is kind of serve as the missing link between those two. So we can plug in our digital signal processing architecture to Thea uh, without our own custom digitizer board in between. That's and that cool. way everybody can kind of keep developing full steam ahead. Because if you think about it, if you're just going to, if you wait for, you know, step one to finish, right, to go on to step two and so on and so forth throughout the yeah, last two years. Yeah, it would take three times as long. Yeah, people yeah. have been very amazed, like, wait, you've done, you've accomplished how much in the last, you yep. know, two years, you know, even 12 to 24 months. Yeah. Um, it is absolutely insane. It's by, you know, working smarter, not harder. Um, and, you know, engineering and developing simultaneously um, with each other. Well, and it's, it's, it's really these modern tools that let us do that. I mean, this wasn't possible 15, 20 years ago. Um, I'll put it up on the screen here so you guys can see, but these software-defined radios that we use, these actually have FPGAs and ADCs inside of them. Yeah. So in a way, they're kind of like a generic version of our digitizer board. So if we have this box here, our, and we can load all of our DSP onto the software-defined radio, we can yeah. literally put Thea's DSP onto a software-defined radio, the only thing we need to figure out um, is how to get this to talk to the actual Thea hardware. So that's what this digitizer board does, is it lets us plug Thea's actual DSP, which we're developing every day, into uh, Thea's hardware and lets us simulate the radar detector. <coughs> so smart. So we've talked about the uh, new riser. Um, what about um, this new laser diode that we have here? Yes, that's another change. So the original uh, Thea laser circuit was based off of the no photo. And this one still is. But when we did performance testing, we discovered that we could actually improve sensitivity by making some changes. The most obvious one is that we switched to a photo diode that has a flat face on it instead of one that has a rounded yeah. face. Yeah. And the reason for that is. We found that when, um, if you're looking at the front of like a, a, any, pretty much any radar detector, you know that bubble, bubble. that's there for the laser? Sure. If you have two bubbles, the lens bubble and then the actual bubble on the photodiode, 
it's extremely difficult to line up the focal point of both of those things. From the outside bubble? Exactly. Because okay. the yep. point of the outside bubble is to collect light from a whole bunch of different directions and then very finely focus mm -hmm. it. And that's also the effect that's on the one on the actual photodiode. So if that's misaligned, you kill your performance. Okay. With a flat photodiode, we can take um, that little pinpoint of light that comes from the mechanical uh, lens bubble and shine it directly exactly into the diode, right into the dye it's called. Hmm. Um, and that gets us a lot better sensitivity. We also made some tweaks to some of the passive components around uh, the photodiode and the circuit, just capacitors, resistors, stuff like that, mm -hmm. to increase the software gain. Um, I think we're going to wind up being pretty sensitive because we, we have enough ability to reject false alerts in software here, um, which other detectors don't really do. And that's been a common issue, right? Like yeah. false alerts with laser. Exactly. Um, I mean, from just ambient to other laser systems in yep. cars and... Um, and that's because there's uh, other detectors don't really have any processing on the laser side of things. They're just saying if the photodiode senses an edge, go off. Yeah. Um, whereas with this, we'll kind of have some intelligence. We'll know specifically we're looking for 100 pulses a second or a certain pattern of pulses. So because of that, we can crank up the sensitivity even to the point where this falses occasionally, but the falsing will not sh be presented to the user because mm. our microprocessor can say, that's not real, that's not real, don't alert, don't alert, don't alert. So it, it's kind of neat. It's just a way that we can get more sensitivity. Incredible. Very cool. Um, yeah. Thanks. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, and this is a good overview for you on where we're at with version 2.0. Um, we're like pretty, pretty much ready to roll with this, right? With this part of it, yeah. yes. As I said, our digitizer is still not done. Um, we're going to be finishing up on that pretty quickly. And But uh, as far as this goes, this is up and running. It's got Linux running on it, Ray's living on there. Um, awesome. it's, it's pretty solid. Cool. Again, if you guys haven't hit uh, subscribe, please do so. We'd love you and your support. Um, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks, guys. Take Bye. care.